Welcome back to another episode of Lincoln Pride Television. I'm Jose Avalos. And I'm Hannah Vorse. Let's, Let's get, get started. started. So Hannah, did you know that around 25% of Iowans have been fully vaccinated? I did not know that. Hopefully more people are getting vaccinated and can help end the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, I just hope people know where they can get vaccinated. Luckily for you, Abby, Andrew, and I did a story about where people can get vaccinated. There's multiple COVID-19 vaccines. Um, the ones that seem to be used the most here in the United States are the mRNA vaccines that were developed by Moderna and Pfizer. Um, so those vaccines use what's called mRNA uh, technology. So basically what happens is when you get the vaccine of an mRNA vaccine, you're injecting a, a code, which the mRNA really is. It's just basically a code. And that code goes into the cells of our body and, um, and tells proteins in the cells of our body to make, based off of that code, a piece of the coronavirus. When your body hasn't seen something before that's inside of it, it doesn't like that. And so it, it produces what are called antibodies. And um, so these antibodies will attach to the, um, the, the protein that the body has made. And then the immune system can um, basically destroy and get rid of, of that. The most recent studies that have been done on the people that have been vaccinated um, that have shown that the vaccines work for at least six months right now. They, they know for sure that the, that the vaccines are effective for six months. Um, I think they'll be coming out shortly with, with more, um, more data on that. So, um, so I think the jury is still out. It's, we still don't know if, if we're going to require, yeah, like a yearly booster or a yearly vaccine. Um, yeah, so I think that masks are still appropriate in certain settings. Um, but if you've been vaccinated, I, I don't think um, you need to wear a mask, you know, if you're gathering outside or um, definitely if you're you have if you're gathering uh, at a gathering with other people that have been vaccinated uh, it's 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 still kind of tricky um, just because a lot of people still aren't vaccinated um, mm -hmm. so you, you have to think about those people and their well-being um, but I, I definitely think if if you're in a group of people that have been vaccinated and you yourself, um, have been vaccinated. Uh, I don't think there's any reason to wear a mask. Kids, you know, the social aspect and the social learning is so important, especially facial expressions, reading mm -hmm. people's faces. So I think um, I, d I don't have a problem with, um, you know, school kids not wearing masks. And it really does come down to its ability um, to stick to our cells in the respiratory tract and, and stay, and more importantly, stay stuck to our cells so that the virus can actually inject its DNA into our cells and then um, infect our cells. So, and it, it goes back to that, that spike protein that's on, on the surface of, of the virus. That it's, it's a really, really advanced um, uh, part of the, the, the coronavirus, that its ability to stick to our cells and grab on just makes it very, very contagious and, and easily transmitted, so. I remember how prominent COVID was before the vaccine came out. Yeah, 2020 was definitely something we didn't see coming. Well, hindsight is 2020. Oh my gosh, that's the name of the play this year. Right, Maggie and I talked with Mr. Mandelko to learn more about it. Where's the house? We're out of toilet paper! I told you we've been eating. 
Even when the virus is long past, what will be the long haul effects on all of us? Those are difficult questions for me to answer. It's hard to think that quarantine was only a little over a year ago. It all feels so recent. I know what you mean, Jose. It's definitely something that will go down in history forever. Oh yeah, it is thunderstorm season right now. You'll want to be extra careful. To be completely honest with you, I don't know the difference between a thunderstorm warning and a thunderstorm watch. She did a story to help you with just that. Woo! That looks like a nasty storm out there. Oh, hey! Welcome to my little weather station. Looks like we're going to have to ride out the storm here. Since you're here, let me tell you about thunderstorm season and other important weather facts to know. And I'll even show you some of my epic interview with WOWT meteorologist Mallory Chanel. In case you couldn't tell, with spring underway and summer following closely behind, we are in the beginning of thunderstorm season. Thunderstorms can happen year round, but are more likely to develop in the spring and summer months due to the conditions and airflow. So a lot of times we see thunderstorm season kick up in late spring and early summer. That's because we're finally starting to get more of that heat, more of that humidity. So those are two things that are really important. You need the moisture for a thunderstorm. So if you can tell the air is really dry, you likely won't be dealing with thunderstorms. Uh, we look at other ingredients in the atmosphere for thunderstorms. You want something called lift, something that's going to cause that air, air to rise. So sometimes when we talk about fronts, that's what we mean. That provides that lift that we need for a thunderstorm to form for that air to rise. You need some rising air for a thunderstorm. Um, so lift, you want moisture and you want heat. However, not all thunderstorms are considered severe. Thunderstorms can range in intensity depending on the type of storm type. So we can get a lot of different types of thunderstorms, a lot of different types of systems here in the middle of the country. And one you'll see that's the most dangerous is called a supercell. And those are individual thunderstorms and they have that hook echo, that hook-like appearance that you'll see in textbooks. And a lot of times they do carry a tornado threat, they carry a large hail threat, um, they're very dangerous. So we always pay attention to supercells. So that's one specific type of thunderstorm, but we also get 
things called squall lines. So a squall line is a much longer storm and the main threat with squall lines, damaging winds. Just think of a long line that kind of bows out. You have that bow echo is what we call it. And as it rushes out, the strong winds uh, kind of take force in front of it. So gusty winds are very, very, uh, a big threat with squall lines. And then we can have our pop-up no normal thunderstorms during the summertime. Um, and those are kind of just called ordinary cell thunderstorms. So yes, different kinds of storms cause different kinds of damage. Um, and that's what we look at when we analyze radar. Along with thunderstorm season, we also have tornado season. Put simply, tornadoes are columns of spinning air that drop from thunderstorm clouds. And as mentioned by Mallory, tornadoes usually come from what are called supercells. Supercells are usually defined by the hook shape coming from the end when looked on a radar or other types of mapping usually shown by news channels. So if there's a tornado warning, that means a tornado has been spotted. As you mentioned, it could be radar indicated or it could be spotted by a storm spotter. That means somebody who has seen it in the field. So a lot of times there are tornado warnings for a storm that we may not know if there's actually a tornado on the ground because we are just looking at radar. And what we are seeing, we'll use a velocity portion of the radar. And what that means is that helps us measure wind speed and direction. And if you see bright reds and bright greens right next to each other on the velocity, that means you have very strong winds going in different directions. So that's when we have the best chance for rotation. So you'll see a meteorologist show that on air. And if you see bright reds, bright greens, that's how you know there's a really tight, what's called couplet. So without a doubt, no matter whether it's radar indicated or spotted by a storm spotter, if there is a tornado warning and you are in the polygon, you should seek shelter immediately because even if it's not on the ground just yet, it could be in the next few minutes. You may have heard of a thing called Tornado Alley. It's a section of the Midwest that houses perfect conditions needed for tornadoes to form. However, some tornadoes can form anywhere in the U.S. at any time. When listening to the news, you've most likely heard of a severe thunderstorm, but many people don't exactly know what a severe thunderstorm brings. So for a thunderstorm to become severe, uh, by definition, it has to have wind speeds or wind gusts, 58 miles per hour or higher, or hail, quarter size, which is an inch in diameter or larger. And also if a thunderstorm uh, creates a tornado, then it would obviously be considered severe as well. But those are kind of the criteria set out by the National Weather Service. And of course, with severe thunderstorms, there is a watch and a warning. But really, what's the difference between a watch and a warning? So the difference between a watch and a warning. A watch means we have the right conditions that day for severe weather to form. Uh, we have the lift, we have the heat, we have the humidity, we have all the right ingredients to create severe weather. We're just not sure exactly how the day will pan out. So a watch will be put in place for a period of hours and for a larger geographic area, so say portions of a state, a warning means severe weather is occurring right now. Uh, warnings are issued for a much smaller area, say portions of Omaha or Council Bluffs, uh, portions of a county for a much shorter period of time because it's actually tracking a specific storm. So a real life example is in the situation of a tornado warning, it is imperative you get to a shelter. According to NPR News, most people don't take shelter right away in a tornado warning due to the fact that they don't feel directly threatened or because there's too many false alarms. Even if a radio station or a news station says that there's no tornado on the ground, at that moment, it could change in practically a second with strong rotation. Well, lucky for us, looks like the storm cleared. I'll talk to you later, Lynx Nation. Where did all the snow come from? I thought we were talking about thunderstorms. I think I hear some holiday music playing somewhere. It's May. It's way too early to be listening to Christmas music. What? It's not totally to be listening to Christmas music. It's not a bad time to listen to Christmas music. I mean... Well, let's just see what Lynx Nation had to say about this with Andrew. LPTV asked you guys if it's too late to listen to Christmas music, and here's the results that we got.
So I don't think it's too early to listen to Christmas music. For me personally, it's November 1st, and the reason why is because I have a Halloween playlist that I listen to all of October, and then I start Christmas November 1st. And then what My favorite song is Carol of the Bells. Why is it too early? I think I told you this. It's really hard for me to consider the alternative. Even though the majority of you guys said it was totally to listen to Christmas music, as long as it makes you happy, then listen to it. Because if it makes you happy, that's all that matters because happiness is key to life. This has been Andrew Rapp asking Abraham Lincoln High School if it was totally to listen to Christmas music. Well, that's all the time we have for, for this episode. And from all the staff here at LPTV, thanks, thanks for, for watching. watching. Woo! We did it. <laughs>